focus group uh, dissolution drug release. And uh, I show you the other focus groups of the uh, sick regulatory sciences and quality. We have the analytical sciences, which is headed by Masaru Kato from Japan. We have the dissolution drug release focus group I'm the chair of. We have the bioclassification biowaver group, which is chaired by Jenny Dressman from Germany. We have the bioavailability bioplants group, which is shared by Shinji Yamashita from Japan, and the clinical bridge studies headed by Oliver Hu in Taiwan. And as I said, I will go more into detail what the group dissolution uh, drug release is doing. Uh, we provide a global independent platform for scientific discussion among academia, industry, and regulators on the solution drug release testing. The group reviews and comments on draft guidelines which impact dissolution testing. The focus group also participated in the drafting of the ICH guidance on bioclassification system-based biowavers, that's ICH M9, by providing commands on the draft guidance, the ICH M9 guideline and their question and answer paper reached step four in November 2019. The group published several papers. I will mention only a few. Uh, that is important, the FIP guidelines for dissolution testing for solid oral dosage forms. There's a report on dissolution in vitro release testing of novel special dosage forms. And there we plan a revision. This is currently under preparation. We published a position paper on the qualification of pedal and basket dissolution apparatus. We organize workshops in several countries. For example, we had one viral and dissolution testing in the United States and in Europe. We had one on nanomedicines, the dissolution in vitro release testing of novel special dosage forms. And we have hands-on dissolution workshops where we have more practical aspects how to uh, handle the apparatus and um, so that we can improve the drug product quality. Recently, we have started to organize webinars, especially during the COVID pandemic uh, time. We, the first one was on the qualification of dissolution apparatus. Then we had one on the guideline for dissolution testing of solid oral dosage forms, in vitro in vivo correlation, virulent dissolution testing. And today we have the semi-solid topicals uh, topic, and it is planned to have a webinar on suspensions and dissolution in the context of continuous manufacturing, which is scheduled for end of November. The focus group um, comprises of members from different regions and affiliations. We have in that group regulators from Europe, FDA, and Japan. We have representatives from industry from the United States, France, and Germany, academia, Greece, and Romania, pharmacopoeia from EDQM and USP, and WHO, Switzerland. This is what to give you more insight in, about on the structure and uh, the um, topics the focus group is doing. And now I would like to introduce my uh, moderator, and I welcome uh, the moderator, uh, Xi. Um, 
Dr. Sri is a pharmacist of biopharmacy, is focusing on dissolution technology, viral dissolution, and in vitro in vivo correlations. Since 2009, he has started his study and research of biopharmacy, dissolution and release, and formulation development at the University uh, Auvergne Clermont. After several years of formulation development, he started his work in Eurofins fast development. He and his teams are mainly focusing on formulation development, such as nano suspensions, nano emulsions, ophthalmic dosage forms, and dissolution method development and validation. Before I hand over to Dr. C, I will uh, have also some technical things. Um, the presentation of Flavia Rambulescu will take about 45 minutes. And then we will have the opportunity to have a panel discussions. And you can write your questions into the question and answer uh, box so that then we uh, review this. And with this, I uh, would like to hand over to Dr. Xi, who will introduce uh, you, the speaker. Thank you, Dr. Fidel. Thank you, FI <clears throat> Thank you, FIP. We have this opportunity to have this webinar. Um, I'm going to present our main, our speaker, um, Dr. Flavia Stefan Hadulescu. So, Dr. Flavia Hadulescu is an associated professor at the Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Carlo Davida in Bucharest. He is in. He works in the Department of Biopharmaceutics. So. Um, Dr. Hadulescu's previous work is researching and development of all kinds of dosage forms, such as liquid, oral, and orthotermic dosage forms. He worked also in, in the design and the implementation of the protocols of bioequivalency studies. Since 2017, he is one of the coordinators of the Center for Drug Science, founded in a collaboration by the University and the Romanian Academy, section of the medical science. The research activities include, include development and the validation of compendial and non-compendial in vitro drug release methodologies for the solid and the semi-solid dosage forms. For topical semi-solids, he participates in several collaborative projects with partners from the pharmaceutical industry using correlated in vitro release, rheological assessment, and additional comparison of physiochemical parameters for the demonstration of Q3 similarity. I will now give the speech to Dr. Hadulescu. Thank you, Dr. C and uh, uh, Dr. Fidel for the introduction to this uh, meeting. I will uh, now share the slides. Okay, I hope that uh, they are visible to everyone. So the topic of uh, the today presentation is the importance of in vitro release testing and uh, possible regulatory implication for topical semi-solid dosage forms. Uh, first, I would like to, uh, sorry. I would like to uh, present you a brief outline of my presentation. I will initially talk about uh, the biological barrier, the complexity of the scheme as the interface on which we uh, usually apply topical products. Also, a brief description of the complexity of the formulations applied onto the skin and how they interact one with the other. Uh, I will uh, present the particularities of the topical semi-solids as uh, uh, special dosage forms, a brief description of uh, historical aspects in the development of the in vitro list tests, 
the usual setup, which parameters are um, screen for the development of those methods, what type of devices are used for the evaluation of the release rates, that is the typical vertical diffusion cells, but uh, as probably most of you know, several other models are presented in compendial chapters. I will also try to present what is the degree of similarity and what are the main differences between the in vitro release test and in vitro permeation tests. What are the criteria currently used either in US or in Europe for method development and validation? And finally, I will try to present uh, not only the evolving role of IVRT in vitro release tests, but also the added value of IVRT in the research development and evaluation of uh, topicals. So briefly, uh, the skin is a highly complex barrier on which the topical products are applied. The intended effect is either uh, restricted to a local region, sometimes the uh, active ingredient uh, generates uh, an effect at the deeper layer or even generates an exposure at the systemic level. Uh, as a consequence of application of the topical products, the skin reacts, that is, um, the skin is sometimes already altered by a pathological process, sometimes the integrity of the barrier is compromised, but also as a result of the interaction with the components of the semi-solid, the skin will change in permeability, for example. Uh, usually, the process of uh, release uh, and delivery of the API is described as a three-stage uh, three uh, phenomena. First, it is the delivery of the API of the drug across the semi-solid layer towards the skin, the partition between the semi-solid formulation uh, with the first layer of the skin, which is the stratum corneal, and which, by the way, opposes the highest resistance to the uh, penetration. And in some cases, the delivery uh, of the drug is intended for uh, deeper layers, such as uh, um, epidermis or dermis. There is a huge, sometimes a huge uh, difference in permeability in between individuals, but also from region to region. That is, the permeability of the skin is variable, and this is one of the problems. The other uh, issues is that sometimes um, it is uh, difficult to measure the concentration of the API at the site of direct action. So as a consequence of the complexity of the skin, of the reactiveness of the uh, biological barrier, it's frequently very difficult to develop a single methodology will be, uh, which will be able to address all the uh, possible way of uh, uh, penetration and acting of the drug uh, on uh, once it is applied onto the skin. Also, as a difference compared to the conventional dosage forms, it's very difficult to assign an excipient as an inert one. That is, everything that is applied onto the skin triggers a response. For example, even water, when it's applied onto the skin, changes the hydration status and therefore may change the permeability of an API. So one should also consider the fact that once the drug is applied onto the skin, the product itself will change. Sometimes a level of a certain, uh, several uh, tens of microns is applied, is exposed to sharing forces, also it heats to the temperature of the skin, and therefore will undergo the so-called transformation or metamorphosis. As a consequence, the delivery rate will change. Also, excipients may uh, be lost during the delivery process. That means that some of the excipients will be lost as a consequence of evaporation, but also excipients are usually transferred uh, toward and through the skin. And so in several instances, it happens that the excipients will be delivered at a different uh, rates. It, uh, they will change the permeability of the skin and therefore will change the third uh, step uh, in the delivery process that is the distribution toward the site of drug action. Depending upon the composition on the excipients, it may happen that the exposure in terms of amount, rate, and duration uh, will be different. Therefore, several methodologies have been uh, screened 
for the evaluation of the in vitro or in vivo performance of the topical dosage forms. In the list on the right-hand side, the first one is a, a subject of our topic today in the terrorist uh, test, but also sometimes traditionally skin samples have been used in order to evaluate the interaction also uh, between the components of the formulation and the skin. As for in vivo uh, uh, methodologies that have been applied, from 1997, uh, sorry, 1995, the vasoconstriction assay has been used officially for the evaluation of the uh, bioequivalence of uh, corticoid uh, cream gels and ointments, but also other methodologies have been screened, such as the dermatopharmacokinetics or skin stripping, several uh, microdialysis techniques or uh, transepidermal uh, water loss. Uh, as a particularity, due to the difficulties in the uh, evaluation of in vivo uh, outcome, clinical endpoint studies have been uh, um, uh, used as a reference method for the evaluation of the topical products. Uh, in terms of the formulation itself, the topical formulations, of course, there is a um, uh, association between a drug and the excipients. And the excipients are critically impacting not only the conditions uh, which are intended to be treated, but also the impact, the quality, and the safety of the product. The quality is impacted by the fact that a certain combination of excipients in certain amounts will trigger a certain state of aggregation of the API. Also, uh, they will provide a certain solubility for the drug. Therefore, it will impact the partition between the formulation and the stratum corneum. And uh, last but not least, it will impact the stability of the product. The combination of excipients and drug uh, will generate a certain microstructure. That is uh, the particularity of semi-solids is that they are systems which are not in thermodynamic equilibria. That means that uh, the combination will uh, give a certain release mechanism, uh, a certain response to external sharing forces to temperature. Also, the products are usually uh, conditioned as tubes. That means that once the patient will apply, the product will also apply a certain sharing force onto the product. The product will undergo a transformation, a certain degree of transformation before the uh, spreading onto the skin. So uh, last but not least, I was already talking about the metamorphosis, the changes that occur onto the product. Excipients may be directly involved into the um, our therapeutic outcome, but also may trigger uh, irritations or uh, uh, sensitization uh, reactions. Therefore, they are directly involved also in the uh, safety uh, profile of the product. As a special dosage form, the topical semi-solids have been subject uh, to several uh, meeting reports. Uh, some of them were, which were, were published under the uh, all species of FIP. Uh, for the special dosage forms in general, uh, there is an undeniable role and uh, an, uh, a need for a performance tests, which are different compared to the conventional dosage form. Uh, throughout the time, uh, there have been several attempts to develop a standardized test, which will be able to meet the in vivo context for uh, the uh, performance of the topicals, and particularly for, for semi-solids, um, we are not only missing the uh, appropriate tools in order to uh, evaluate the in vivo exposure, the rate and extent at which the drug is uh, released and uh, attains the site of action, but also due to the lack of uh, those methods frequently uh, in vitro in vivo correlations have failed to be developed. And also to, due to the particularities of the skin and reactiveness of the skin, biorelevant methods are easily are um, usually more difficult to be developed. And when developing a generic product, uh, this uh, needs to take into account all the particularities of the semi-solids. That is, uh, the safest way to develop a generic is to select the same excipients as the reference product, 
also to uh, select the same amounts of the same excipients, eventually the same grade if the excipients uh, are available in several grades from uh, several providers. And uh, one thing to uh, be uh, taken care of is the fact that excipients frequently for topical forms are complex mixture. That means that they are not standardized single component uh, um, entities, but rather a mixture of components. And this will mean that the interactions between the API and the excipients, this mixture of excipients may diff be different and from one batch to the other of that uh, particular excipient. Also, uh, combining the same excipients in the same amount will not warranty that you will reach the same semi-solid uh, structure because uh, the resulting arrangement of the matter is depending upon the manufacturing process. That means the way the excipients are arranged, the order of addition uh, of the excipients and so on. And for the characterization of this semi-solid matrix, several physical chemical tests has, have, have been already in place. Usually it is the density, the pH, the uh, evaluation using optical microscopy of the particles, uh, geometry of the particle size of the droplet size and so on. But throughout the time, uh, it has been proposed that one test can be reflective of all the individual physical chemical characteristics which are um, uh, determined. And uh, one additional level of similarity between a generic and the reference product is uh, recently proposed. That means the methods and means of application, because as I already indicated, uh, the method and means of application can dramatically change uh, the performance of the uh, drug uh, product. So what is the history of the topical uh, of the uh, in vitro release test applied for topical semi-solids? The pioneer work has been done back in the 1980s, 1990s. It was uh, conducted mainly by uh, Dr. Vinod Shah. And there were several reports mentioning the results uh, obtained using this technique. And uh, uh, last but not least, it uh, is important to mention that uh, in those reports, in several of these reports, it has been mentioned that uh, uh, there is a relation between the in vitro release and the uh, in vivo uh, performance, especially for glucocorticoids, uh, creams, gel, and ointments, because for those products, the blanching effect of the skin, um, um, vasoconstriction assay was in place. This led finally to the uh, publication in 1997 of the so-called SUPAC SS uh, uh, guidance. This guidance included for the very first time the use of in vitro release tests for screening of the potential impact of controlled, well-defined changes in composition and or manufacturing process. I will also like to, uh, to mention in this context the publication of uh, DPK drug guidance. For those of you which are not familiar with this technique, it basically consists of stripping the stratum corneum using uh, adhesive tapes. Well, in this drug guidance, which unfortunately was uh, withdrawn back in 2002 due to apparently conflicting results obtained for uh, retinoin uh, products, in this drug guidance, it was mentioned an extended role of IVRT. And uh, interestingly, uh, one of the role was to use IVRT in order to screen uh, lower strength products once the bioequivalence of the high strength product for a generic was already demonstrated. And also it was uh, stated that IVRT may be used in order to uh, evaluate more extensive changes beyond the limits that were already defined in the uh, SUPAC SS guidance. Further on, the Japanese authorities considered the use of IVRT in order to select a representative batch uh, of product which was uh, further on tested in vivo. And in 2010, in a pharmacopoeial forum, 
uh, stimuli for revision proce uh, process article was uh, published, which for the very first time described a certain setup, a certain protocol for a certain product that is the hydrocortisone cream 1%, which further was proposed as a product for performance verification test. Also an important moment was the, uh, the issue of the uh, draft guidance for a cyclovir ointment 5%. It was one of the first drug guidances for topicals, which included uh, an in vitro option. Besides the comparative physical chemical characterization, in vitro release testing was proposed in order to compare the generic uh, test product and the reference product. The option, the in vitro option was uh, supported by two arguments. The first one was the fact that it was a very simple formulation. It consisted basically of a mixture of two polyethylene glycols, excipients, which can be easily characterized, and uh, a cyclovir, which is suspended in the semi-solid matrix. That was the first argument. And the second argument, uh, as provided in, in the response to a citizen petition, was the fact that the physical chemical characteristics, characteristics which affect uh, bioavailability are uh, known. In 2013, the USP chapter 7024 was published. Briefly, this included the description of several models of vertical diffusion cells and also uh, it uh, uh, took um, a part of the assumptions which are already, or, or the requirements that are already published in the uh, SUPAC SS drug guidance. 2013, the year of publication for a cyclovir cream drug guidance, which included beside IVRT uh, on in vitro test performed on skin samples, uh, mainly because uh, acyclovir creams uh, represent a more complex formulation and uh, it consisted of uh, addressing multiple ways in which the generic formulation can fail to provide the same therapeutic uh, effect as the reference. Further on, the European authorities adopted uh, uh, a draft island, which included the in vitro release test as part of the extended concept of pharmaceutical equivalence. And uh, last, uh, uh, during the last two years, uh, USP has published and finally adopted a revision to that chapter. So briefly mentioning what was the role uh, in the SUPAC um, uh, uh, guidance, it was designed to evaluate the, uh, the impact of level two changes, that is the changes in the qualitative composition, quantitative composition, and the parameter of operating principles uh, for the manufacturing of a certain uh, topical formulation. And uh, those changes were well defined. So IDRT was for the first time a tool to evaluate the potential impact of changes on the in vivo performance of the uh, topical semi-solids. So IDRT was developed in analogy with in vitro dissolution. I will briefly mention the differences between the two types of tests. Usually um, the products are tested according to the SUPAC SS uh, job guidance are tested uh, at two stages. Uh, it is a model dependent approach that is the in vitro release profile from the semi-solid matrix uh, is used for calculation of an in vitro release rate, and this in vitro re release rate is used to be compared between two formulations. It started as a simple test, but it gradually evolved toward a more uh, uh, complex tool with more relevance. Uh, an extension, as I indicated previously, was proposed back in 1997. <laughs> it started also to be used for a comparison of formulation across manufacturers, first with simple formulation, but then it gradually evolved also to be used as part of the, of the in vivo option for more complex formulation. It became part of the uh, so-called aggregate weight of evidence, totality of evidence or extended pharmaceutical equivalence concept. 
And uh, in terms of uh, potential application, there are several product-specific drug guidelines which has been uh, have been issued by um, FDA, which uh, include uh, uh, IDRT. So, what is the assumption behind the current use of IDRT? Well, is the Higuchi model, the so-called square root model. If you go back to the 1961 uh, uh, article of Higuchi, there are several uh, conditions which need to be fulfilled before applying uh, this model. Those conditions, the use and misuse of this model have been reviewed by Professor Sigmund and Pepas back in 2011. So briefly, it consists of evaluation of the release through the semi-solid matrix, the dr uh, drug transport across this matrix is the rate limiting step. Uh, the receiver acts as a perfect sink. The initial concentration is higher compared to the solubility of the drug that is tested in the semi-solid matrix. That means that the drug is in suspension. Not only that is suspended, but also it is finally dispersed into the uh, semi-solid base. It is homogeneously dispersed uh, and the dissolution of the drug from the solid particle is uh, faster compared to the re, uh, diffusion uh, rate. Also, the edge effects are neglectable. And uh, last but not least, the donor compartment, the semi-solid formulation that is tested, it's not changing throughout the test. That is, it's not swelling, nor is resolving throughout the test. So basically those conditions have been translated into requirements in the development of a um, uh, IVRT test. What is, it is evaluated initially, uh, um, what it is observed in an IVRT profile is a lag time, which is variable, prefilability is very low, reduced. Then a steady state release, which is important because the slope of this portion of the curve, this is a property of the formulation and it is used for comparative uh, purposes, uh, purposes, either between formulations uh, across manufacturer or between formulations before and after certain changes. And towards the end, because uh, the donor compartment uh, is gradually depleting, toward the end, you will notice a change in the kinetics. Usually during this test, uh, sync conditions are mandatory. It is very uh, difficult to achieve sync conditions if you want to simulate also some bioelevant conditions, for example, pH 5.5, which is assumed to be relevant for the skin conditions, is not uh, feasible to be used in order to provide adequate solubility for the API. The drug is suspended, so, but at the same time, the same model is successfully applied also for systems which contain the drug completely solubilized. Due to the design of the diffusion cells that are currently available and used, uh, thickness of the semi solid layer is usually greater compared to the particle uh, size. Homogeneity is assumed, but sometimes due to, for example, the tests are conducted at 32 degrees, it may happen for a drug that is suspended in the semi-solid matrix, especially when the viscosity is low. It may happen that the particle will uh, uh, precipitate onto the membrane once the product is applied and reaches the temperature of testing. It is also uh, important to consider the receiving boundary layer, which is the driving force of the uh, overall process. And last but not least, uh, it is important to consider that no back diffusion occurs. That is the diffusion occurs only in one direction from the donor through a semi-solid membrane, which holds separate and distinct two compartments to our receiver, which is able to provide uh, sync conditions. The usual design of the diffusion cell consists of three compartments. The donor compartment, usually it is occluded. Of course, this is the first element that suggests that the test, uh, the IDRT test is not a bioelevant test uh, because most of the drug products are applied onto the skin and the skin is not occluded. But in this setup, in order to evaluate the slope of the release profile as a property of the formulation, usually 
as indicated in the conditions for the Higuchi model, the composition of the donor compartment or a reservoir of the formulation needs to be um, uh, maintained approximately constant. A pseudo infinity dose of formulation is applied and this is, does not swell nor dissolves throughout the test. The available designs of cells accommodate various quantities of uh, uh, semi-solid formulations. That is, is rather easy, I would say, in most of the instances to uh, compile with the requirements of pseudo infinite dose. The donor compartment is not steered and is directly or indirectly temperature control that is, is maintained at 32 degrees Celsius. For vaginal products, the temperature is 37 degrees. Also design and materials may provide protection against pho photo degradation. Also one element is the direction which, uh, in which the diffusion process occurs because in most of the cases for the vertical diffusion cells, this may lead because the direction of the diffusion is uh, top down, this may lead to some artifacts, meaning that air bubbles may accumulate underneath the membrane. It will reduce the surface available for diffusion. Also the membrane, another factor which suggests the lack of relevance for the, uh, this type of uh, test and setup, the membrane is usually an artificial one. It's a mixture of uh, polymers, usually hydrophilic, but also hydrophobic or lipophilic uh, uh, poly uh, membranes have been used. The conditions that uh, are imposed to the, those membranes that they should be compatible, should not interact with neither donor compartment components or the receiver and should not be rate limited. Of course, there are several membranes uh, uh, available onto the market which uh, are able to, let's say, simulate uh, the lipophilicity of the stratum cornea. However, in many instances, those membranes, despite the fact that they claim to be more relevant, they oppose uh, a resistance to the diffusion of the API. Therefore, they are not suitable for accurate development of an in vitro release uh, test. Usually they are uh, ultra or micro filtration membranes. And uh, they uh, their only role is to maintain separate and distinct the two compartments. Of course, there are several specifications for several type of membranes from various providers. Uh, simply considering the materials and the pore size is not enough. Sometimes between uh, manufacturers, uh, there might be differences concerning the tortuosity or the density of the pores and so on. And this may lead further on to differences in in vitro release. And finally, the, flu uh, the receptor fluid, which is selected mainly on the, uh, based on the requirement of seam conditions. Therefore, the solubility, the adequate solubility of the, uh, the drug is a critical component in order to uh, accurately evaluate uh, the in vitro release rate. But also other factors is uh, to be considered is the fact that the receptor compartment or the uh, uh, receptor fluid should be compatible with uh, the membrane. Particularly for topicals, as many of the drugs have lipophilic characteristics, solubility increasing agents are usually used. Uh, it is not uh, unusual for IVRT to have as a receptor uh, media uh, a hydroalcoholic uh, mixture. In some uh, very complicated cases, other organic solvent have been proposed, but uh, the, uh, those solvents such as tetrahydrofurane or acetonitrile, those uh, solvents may create further problems in terms of compatibility uh, with uh, the, uh, um, the membrane. Also particular for, for the you know, IDRT, the degassing, because I, as I initially mentioned, the air bubbles may create problems, especially in the uh, vertical diffusion cells as they will reduce it, uh, the surface available uh, for diffusion and will increase the variability of the uh, results. 
This is an example of comparing the design of the vertical diffusion cells available from one manufacturer. Uh, the receiver uh, may have a cylindrical or funeral form, may have different volumes, may have different height, different type of uh, steering, and this may lead to different uh, efficiency in terms of uh, homogenization of the receptor compartment. One thing that should be also considered when you select the media is the fact that usually during each sampling, uh, sampling procedure, uh, uh, fresh media, fresh blank media is introduced into the cell. So uh, this will further contribute to uh, the compliance to the same condition requirement. For example, for a four ML cell with one milliliter sampling, this will mean that each sampling will renew uh, a quarter of the uh, media. Adaption to the standard dissolution equipment are available. For example, the so-called immersion cell, either enhancer cell or uh, ointment cells are uh, presented in the uh, USB chapter 7024. Of course, using an available platform as for the, the uh, conventional dissolution test is, is an advantage. The operator uh, uh, is used with the equipment. Automation may be already in place. Also, the equipment is partially subjected to qualifications as, such as the steering rate or the temperature. But also an advantage to be considered is the fact that usually volumes up to 150 or 200 ml of media are used. That is, it is more far easier to comply with the same condition requirements. An additional factor is the, that tensioactives may be used as a solubility increasing agent. Uh, because the direction of the diffusion is uh, bottom up. There are also some of these advantages mentioned in the literature, for example, uh, as you are using a higher volume of the uh, receptor media, this will decrease the concentration of the API. Of course, in case of uh, IVRT, uh, different from IVPT, that is the test that are using skin samples, the concentration are higher. But in case of high potency formulation, it may be a problem, especially if the drug is released at slow uh, rates. That means that the concentration level is much slower. Also, one point to be considered is the heat transfer profile. Those cells, the immersion cells, are usually manufactured of low, uh, um, um, low iner uh, of inert materials such as polytetrafluoroethylene, which have a poor heat transfer. That means that usually, especially in case of some uh, formulations of high consistency, there is a heating pattern which will turn into a higher uh, uh, lag time. Also, if the tests are longer than usual, that is longer than four or six hours, there is a considerable risk of losing the components, especially the volatile, volatile components of the receptor media. And last but not least, as mentioned in the 7024 chapter, at least in the current version, the semi-solid adapters, that is the adapters which are inserted in the flow uh, through cell to USB apparatus for. The advantages that I uh, have noted while working on those uh, adapters is the fact that they have a better temperature control, uh, there is the advantage of standardized flow pattern inside the, uh, the flow through cell. There is a theoretically unlimited uh, volume of receptor media that can be used. Also, uh, the flow pattern ensures the fact that the drug is effectively removed once it has diffused across the membrane. There is a low potential for evaporation loss. That means the, the longer test duration are easy to be performed. And uh, especially if you consider some of the requirements available, at least in the EMA drug guideline, it may be uh, useful to use those semi-solid adapters in order to um, uh, achieve an advanced depletion of the donor. Just briefly mention what is the difference between, what are the differences between IVRT and IVPT. Uh, usually IVP, IVPT simulates better the in vivo condition. First of all, it uses skin samples. It uses uh, human skin. Uh, 
either full thickness or more frequently split thickness uh, skin, layers of skin of 200, 500 uh, microns. Uh, a finite dose, which is justified, usually uh, is applied using various techniques, uh, such, as, uh, such as the inverted HPLC vial or uh, uh, fingertip or spatula technique. So the layer of formulation is reflective of the in vivo uh, therapeutic conditions of application. Usually the tests are longer because the process of penetration permeation uh, is far more complex. Usually the test lasts for 24, 48 hours, as long as the integrity of the uh, skin barrier can be uh, ensured. Uh, the delivery usually occurs with a longer lag time then the maximum flux across the skin need to be determined. And uh, of course, uh, at, toward the end, the depletion of the donor will be observed. At the end of the test, different from the IVRT, uh, the receiver, the surface, the separate uh, uh, layer of the skin and the receptor media are accumulated in order to calculate uh, the recovery of the drug uh, substance. So the main diffusion in case of IVPT, in, in case of using the skin samples, is actually penetration distribution across the consecutive layers of the skin uh, toward uh, receptor uh, media. The IVPT tests are considered, as I indicated previously, as more relevant. Several effects are usually quantified, uh, that is the donor effect, the product effect, the donor by product interaction, and the similarities concluded based on uh, uh, comparison of uh, and calculation of 90% confidence interval. Whereas for IPRT, depending on the um, um, uh, guidance and the regulatory authorities, usually uh, the steady state release rate, the amount released at the end of the uh, linear region and the lag time are used to uh, be compared between the formulations. So I would say that in this comparison, IVRT is able to reflect and aggregate the impact of several uh, physical chemical characteristics of the formulation when used in a comparative manner, and also can signal potential differences in the in vivo performance of the uh, formulations. So the criteria that are currently used for the development and validation are somehow different between the FDA and EMA. It consists mainly of selecting a certain type of cell. Uh, temperature should be reflective of the site of administration, receptor media, membrane, membrane uh, the membrane which should be inert, the mechanical support of the formulation, whether or not a pretreatment of the membrane is applied should be described, when to sample uh, the receptor media in order to produce a significant, to generate a significant uh, uh, release, what is the quantitation uh, method, and of course, uh, how the data is analyzed. In terms of validation, qualification of the equipment should follow in most of the instances, the recommendation uh, of the manufacturer of the cells. Usually, one thing that it should be done is to quantify exactly what is the volume of the receptor compartment. If, for example, a vertical diffusion cell is used for the solubility or for the compliance with the same conditions requiring what should one should consider that uh, a part of the um, development and validation of the method is demonstration of the strength uh, discrimination. That means the method is able to provide different in vitro release rates for uh, formulation we contain different amounts of the same API. For the EMA, there are certain particularities. I should say that the current uh, draft guidelines should have been finalized in 2019, but we still do not have in Europe the final version of this draft guidance. What it is particular for this drug guidance is a uh, requirement, for example, uh, that the method should ideally be able to deplect at least 70% of the drug applied into the donor compartment, which may be very challenging in certain instances, but I read this requirement as the 
uh, need to adequately characterize, especially in the development phase, the whole profile of release of the drug and then to select adequately the interval which will be uh, reflective of the steady state release. For the EMA, the procedure is uh, quite different compared to the FDA in terms of the number of patches to be compared between the reference and the test product and uh, the statistical approach. That means 12 slots, for example, are generated uh, for each of the three batches of the test and the reference product. The sample is at least 36 slopes, 36 amounts released for, uh, for each of the products. And then those uh, values are to be compared based on the calculation of 90% confidence interval. So, Method parameters, I will skip this. Uh, in terms of selection of the membrane of the receptor media, the focus will be, as I indicated previously, on the compatibility, on the solubility of the drug, on the stability of the drug to, uh, throughout the testing period for six uh, hours, usually. And also one additional issue to be considered is the blinding. Why? Because it is sometimes very difficult to, to assure the uh, blinding uh, during the IVRT test. For example, the reference and the test product may have different um, type of tubes and just covering with adhesive tape, the tubes will not, uh, will not do it. Also, once you have selected the membrane, be sure that is available onto the market because uh, sometimes, for example, the, uh, the manufacturing of a certain membrane may be discontinued, such as the polysulfate membrane, which were initially used by many uh, uh, labs which are now uh, currently missing from the market. Also, the fact that between manufacturers, the characteristics of the name may be, uh, may be different. Also, last but not least, think about the role of the membrane, maintain separate and distinct two compartments, and also inert artificial membrane and inert support of the formulation. It should not be selected based on the bioreligance criteria. There is no such a membrane which will be able to simulate the complexity of the skin. One additional thing to be considered is the contact angle and the compatibility as I indicated previously between the receptor, the formulation and the membrane. You should try first to see whether or not the receptor media that is providing adequate solubility will provide also an adequate weighting contact angle with the formulation. And if during the uh, test duration, it will not uh, uh, change uh, the membrane uh, surface or even compromise the integrity. Uh, this is an example of how the profiles will look like. Usually the products are applied, the two, uh, products are applied in an uh, alternative and randomized manner. FDA says that the depletion should reach uh, maximum 30%, but also higher level of uh, depletion uh, up to 50, 60% are not problematic. And I, as I indicated previously, uh, EMA is, uh, has this uh, uh, requirement of uh, ideally 70% per, uh, percent dose depletion. I should say that in certain instances, and I will not insist on this, but just to be mentioned, in certain instances, the square root model, that is the linearity between the quantity release versus surface unit uh, as a function of the square root of time is not linear. This occurs in uh, several particular instances. For example, when uh, one example will be when the formulation contains a high quantity of certain uh, tensioactives, actives, which are released together with the API. And this will mean that in the receivable, you will have a gradually accumulating uh, tensioactive active besides the, uh, the drug. This means that the solubility of the drug will theoretically uh, change throughout the test. Another instance is this, for example, using uh, IVRT to test the release from an uh, oleaginous based, such as petrolatum based ointment, will induce uh, particular profiles. This was explained, and I will not go into the details, it was uh, explained uh, by an alternative model, which um, 
is seems to be applicable, the so-called the logarithm of time model. Basically, it consists of a transient boundary uh, uh, release, a layer, a uh, transient uh, uh, layer, which is formed mainly hydrophilic one, which is gradually expanding at the interface between the oleaginous, highly consistent formulation and the uh, aqueous media used as a uh, receiver. Also, I should mention that several processes such as the back diffusion process, the release, the uh, distribution of components from the receptor media uh, toward, uh, through the membrane towards the donor may change the composition of the neuron and therefore will alter uh, the uh, diffusion profile. What it is usually required for IDRT and, um, is to demonstrate the strength discrimination. That is, formulations are manufactured with altered drug content, usually 50 to 150%, and they are tested. And the relationship between the release rate and uh, uh, the drug content is evaluated. Usually, a linear relationship is obtained between uh, if the drug is dissolving the semi-solid matrix or a linear relationship between the release rate and the square root of concentration where the drug is suspended. Sometimes if the dissolution from the suspended particles is very slow, it may be very difficult, it's, it may be very challenging to demonstrate this uh, uh, such a relationship. So the IVRT according to FDA requirements should be sensitive, specific and selective with respect to the strength uh, in terms of EMA, the linear relationship is uh, expected uh, uh, if the drug is dissolved and the relationship should be explained when the drug is suspended. At least three strengths need to be prepared. And what I would like to mention here is that it's important when you evaluate the relationship between the release rate and the strength, it is important to consider that those different strengths should be manufactured in very well controlled conditions. That is, the only difference that should be uh, present should be the content of the drug and eventually a diluent. But if other uh, differences are induced, such as different manufacturing process for, for this additional strength, 50 to 150, percent, then what it is observed in terms of release rate is not only the difference in strength, but also the difference in the microstructure. It is sometimes very challenging to have those formulations as uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, having the same excipients in the same amount with the same arrangement of the matter, especially in the case of highly concentration uh, formulations. Uh, when changing the amount of drug, also uh, it may happen that the drug will not preserve its state of aggregation for either high or low strength. It may induce a different distribution of the drug into the various uh, phases components of the semi-solid matrix, or if the drug has some um, um, uh, acidobasic uh, function, it may induce changes in pH. It has been mentioned during some presentation that the drug itself, the active ingredient may be a macromolecular agent. Therefore, the alterations in the concentration may induce also changes in the viscosity. Uh, briefly mentioning this, FDA is also discussing about supplemental selectivity. It is allowed according to the FDA also to uh, test comparatively the target uh, formulation and uh, uh, formulation which has the same strength of the same active ingredient, but uh, pharmaceutical equivalence is not a must. And for EMA, it is mandatory, at least according to the current uh, version, that the formulation should uh, the formulation used for discrimination of the microstructure should have the same excipient, that is the same uh, qualitative composition and alternative formulation may be obtained by uh, changing the amount or changing the manufacturing process as in this example where we have tested the target formulation and a formulation which was designed based on this composition, but with uh, lower amounts of uh, excipients, uh, increased amount of water. So what is the uh, evolution of IVRT? 
It started first as a tool, a very useful tool to screen the potential impact on the in vitro, in vivo performance for control changes in either composition or manufacturing process. It gradually extended uh, for comparison of formulation across manufacturer with some restrictions, initially simplicity of the formulation uh, and further on uh, uh, as part of, the, of a tailored approach which include other uh, physical chemical uh, tools and in vitro permeation tests. And it uh, is currently used also to evaluate the stability of the formulation as part of the stability studies and for selection of optimal formulation candidates uh, during the uh, research and development phase. What I would like also to mention is the fact that in the current version of EMA draft guidance, uh, it is suggested somehow that um, uh, IVRT will become part of the product specification. That means that IVRT will eventually become a uh, quality control test for assessing the batch-to-batch -batch, uh, consistency. Well, based on our experience, it is rather difficult uh, to, to have this, mainly because the formulation in some cases changed dramatically throughout the shelf life, not only the test formulation, the generic formulation, but also the reference product. Therefore, establishing IVRT as a QC tool uh, will mean that also acceptance range will need to be adopted. And this will mean that finally, due to sometimes dramatic changes of the microstructure and uh, consequently, consequently of the in vitro release rate, the limits of those specification will be large enough. And having large acceptance range will mean probably that it will be difficult to justify in terms of in vivo uh, relevance. So as a conclusion, IDRT is a useful tool. And as uh, it was initially adopted, it is a test which is relevant. Despite the fact that it's using an artificial membrane, it has a relevance and it has the potential to signal at an early stage, potential changes or differences in the in vitro, in vivo performance. It's a good indicator of composition and microstructural characteristics. Uh, the adequate interpretation usually is depending upon adequately evaluating the differences existing between the formulation. That means that, for example, IVRT comparison between formulation which has uh, huge differences in terms of qualitative composition will lead to meaningless uh, results. So actually, despite the fact that it's, it is using an artificial membrane, it has a relevance as long as the role of the excipients, the microstructure, the other physical chemical characteristics, characteristics are adequately um, um, assessed. Of course, the main disadvantage is the fact that is not uh, IVRT is not using a dose nor conditions which are able to simulate the metamorphosis, the transformation uh, that occur once the product is applied onto the skin. However, as I stated previously, IVRT non-similarity indicates a high risk of non-equivalent um, performance. With this, I would like to thank you for, for your attention. And if there are questions, I will be happy to answer them. My my deepest thanks to Dr. Hadulescu for his very informative and uh, very exciting presentation. I personally learned a lot from his systematic introduction. Now is the questions and the question session. I have first a question here um, to Dr. Hadulescu. Is it usual or is it normal to use real skin membranes such as rat skin or human skin for quality assurance tests? I would say no, definitely not, because uh, especially animal skin, in uh, a quality control procedure will mean that the method is 
accurate, sensitive, and uh, reproducible. That means that, for example, if certain results are obtained, you must be sure that those results are somehow connected with the quality or the performance of the product. Using skin usually, it uh, um, means that variability will be there because variability is a biological factor. It is usually uh, recorded during the IVPT or, or uh, uh, in vivo testing, such as the dermatopharmacokinetics. For quality control purposes, I would say that uh, reproducible membranes, inert membranes, will uh, do it. However, as I indicated, for IVRT to be used as a quality control test for topicals, it may be problematic. Because mainly because what you are testing, it's a system which gradually evolves. It is part of the life cycle of the topicals. Therefore, you will, will be assuming that throughout the shelf life, the microstructure will change sometimes dramatically and a sensitive IVRT will reflect that. Thank you very much for reply. Here comes the second question. When an IVRT shows pharmaceutical equivalence, such as sameness between a test and the reference product, what factors can influence differences in in vivo performance? And why an IVPT necessary? Well, IVPT has a big advantage, at least at this moment, because it actually uses skin. That means that it reflects closer the in vivo context of evolution or the performance of the uh, topicals. As I indicated during my presentation, a dose which is reflecting the therapeutic use is applied, not a pseudo infinite dose. And uh, I think that uh, there are more data available correlating or relating the IVPT data with the in vivo performance. Whereas for IVRT, what we have observed also during the initial stages back in the 80s and 90s was the fact that rank order relationships are obtained. For example, for corticoids, a more intensive uh, blanching effect was correlating, correlated with higher release rates. But if you think in terms of traditional in vitro in vivo correlations, that means you need to obtain a mathematically predictive relationship between an in vivo parameter and in vitro parameter. And this is particularly cha challenging for IVRT. So I would say that uh, at this moment, uh, for more, as I indicated during my presentation, for more complex formulation for, for a cream, which contains the drug suspended, but also distributed between the different phases of the same uh, uh, semi-solid matrix, IVPT, it's an additional uh, tool which mitigate the potential risk of uh, having a product which will not provide the same therapeutic effect as the reference product. Thank you very much for your reply. Here comes the third question. And as you indicate that the matrix is continuously changing during the test, do you see a way to overcome that issue? Uh, it is, if I understood correctly the question, uh, the, uh, the, the question talks about the changes of the formulation during the test or during yes. the shelf life? I think uh, during the test. Well, that will be uh, very problematic, I would say. Uh, what we uh, observe during the test that we have conducted in our lab for example, you will observe in certain cases, especially for the hydrophilic gels when, in which uh, 
for example, um, the, the matrix is not adequately hydrated. When you are testing that in an in vitro setup, what you will observe will be uh, back diffusion. That is, the water will diffuse across the membrane into the donor compartment. What I recommend usually is to evaluate that, uh, accurately the donor compartment at the end of the test to see how it has changed and to understand if you have a back diffusion, how to overcome this. The first uh, attempt will be uh, to change the composition of the uh, re uh, receptor media, which is not easy to do. But the second one will be to try to evaluate the product uh, with more frequent sampling in the first part of the test and to make sure that you will evaluate the slope, the release rate into a region in which the back diffusion has not changed dramatically the, the, um, uh, the donor compartment. Because you need to be sure that that release rate is reflective of the characteristics of the donor of the formulation that you are testing, not of the formulation change by the interaction with the test conditions. Thank you very much. And I think um, we might close the questions section by the last question. And this question is quite uh, general. So um, Dr. Hadulescu, will you please give information what are different types of IVIVC and how we use in our dosage form formulation? In, I think in the development of the dosage form formulation. Well, I would say uh, that um, what we have usually observed in terms of IVRT is a rank order relation between the release rate and some in vivo parameters. We have been applying, for example, skin stripping uh, as a tool for in vivo evaluation. And we have observed some rank order. Uh, but if the uh, person who asked this question thinks about the four levels, three or four levels of in vitro in vivo correlations and just having uh, uh, a point-to-point -point correlation between a dermatopharmacokinetic profile and an in vitro release profile. I think that will not be feasible. It will not be uh, feasible in, I'm, I'm just saying based on our experience to easily obtain uh, a direct correlation between the two, two set of parameters. Yeah. Okay, here's the last one. This is really the last one. After this, we are going to close the question section. Um, as Dr. Hadouescu, you mentioned that excipients used in formulations may often be complex mixtures, which even show inter-batch variability. So why such excipients are chosen? Well, think about, think about uh, paraffin or think about uh, um, other lipidic components. They are usually mixtures of uh, two or more components. For example, if I will uh, say that for a cream, usually cetosteryl alcohol is uh, uh, used. Cetosteryl, if you look into any uh, spe uh, specific monograph from the pharmacopoeia, you will find that the limit for the two components is so large. That means a mixture between uh, two fatty components, which depending upon their ratio, quantitative ratio will give a higher or lower consistency of the formulation. I'm not talking about the series of other rheological parameters, which can be determined and uh, might be uh, different between the formulations. So this is the situation, especially with the uh, lipophilic components. And those are the excipients used when you are performing the reverse engineering, for example, you will find out that paraffin represents, I don't know how, what, how much amount, but the next step will be to critically analyze if the several fractions, hydrocarbon fractions 
which are composing paraffin are relevant for the way the product will uh, perform. The stability of the product, the quality, the stability, and the performance of the product. So this is one of the particularities of the uh, uh, of the lipidic complex uh, excipients. Thank you very much for your reply. And uh, I think uh, this will be the end of the question section. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hadulescu, for your very informative presentation, the very useful replies on these questions. I'll give the speech back to Dr. Friedel. Yeah, uh, Slavian Radulescu, many thanks for the very informative and scientific based presentation. We learned a lot and uh, on the semi-solid dosage forms and the dissolution in vitro release testing for these dosage forms. Thank you for this very good presentation. And see, thank you very much for the moderation. And I thank all the participants to be here today and to ask the questions. I'm very happy that we had so many participants today. And I would like to close this webinar uh, with out announcing that we will continue this series of webinars from the focus group dissolution testing. Uh, the next one will be uh, dissolution testing in the context of continuous manufacturing. And with that, I thank you all and I close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.